so I'm going to just introduce myself quickly. My name's Will Rathaus. Uh, can everyone hear me okay all the way up the back there? Uh, now, I studied for a BA and subsequently a PhD in archaeology or archaeology and anthropology uh, at what was when I first started, the University of Wales Lampeter. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> So yeah, I started out uh, study, studying for a BA in Archaeology and Anthropology at the University of Wales Lampeter, which subsequently became the University of Wales Trinity St David when I started my PhD. And uh, whilst studying for that PhD, looking at uh, challenges in heritage and contestation of heritage and human remains, um, I started to work with people with mental health problems. Initially, I was supporting uh, students at the university uh, with not just not just mental health problems but also learning disabilities but uh, they then recommended me for a job with MIND and uh, I've now been working for MIND Aberystwyth for uh, over five years. Now today I'm going to set out a case for managing archaeological heritage in such a way as to ensure that people with autistic spectrum disorders and or mental health problems are not excluded and ideally actively included. I will also be raising awareness of the use of archaeological fieldwork as therapeutic activity uh, or as something to help people through recovery and uh, specifically within mental health and calling for further research into best practice in these projects. So I'm going to start out by trying to uh, define what we mean by mental health and mental health problems. Now the World Health Organization of the United Nations defines mental health as a complete state of physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease. The Health Education Authority provides a slightly fuller definition which is the emotional and spiritual resilience which allows us to enjoy life and survive pain, disappointment and sadness. It is a positive sense of well-being and an underlying belief in our own and others dignity and worth. Common mental health problems include depression, which is not just sadness, but equally partakes of self-loathing, despair and emotional numbness. Anxiety provides a situation where even apparently innocuous things can inspire such dread that a person may not be able to leave their house without experiencing a panic attack, which in turn can feel a lot like a heart attack. Post-traumatic stress disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder are related issues within that sort of area. Psychoses involve delusions, false ideas, hallucinations, full sensory experience. No, these are not often visual, but often auditory. For example, hearing voices. Now, when I did my training for MIND, we had put in groups of three, and a person had to whisper in the ear. Um, and when I was the patient, the person experiencing the mental health problems, the person whispering in my ear whispered her shopping list. I found it quite easy to zone that out. When I was the voices, I chose to be a little bit more unpleasant. Uh, I said, whispered to the person experiencing, be careful of that person you're talking to. She's not listening to you. Look at the way she looks at you. You want to be worried, wary about that. So that's one kind. Another person whom I work with closely hears people talking about her, and this induces an awful paranoid state. So mental health problems such as these of course, make everyday social interactions difficult, often impossible. And that in turn cycles back in, making the mental health problems worse. They can bring about self-neglect, self-harm and suicide. Autism is not a mental health problem. It is defined as a developmental disorder but maybe more accurately described as a variation in the neural or cognitive architecture of the brain. 
it is generally determined, it is genetically determined, and is not, never mind what certain Hollywood celebrities might tell us, the result of upbringing or childhood vaccinations. Presentation of autism varies enormously, and specialists have identified a spectrum from the neurotypical majority, clustered at one end, through Asperger's syndrome to classic or Kenner's autism, sufferers of which may be completely nonverbal. Now, in this paper, I'm going to make reference much more to people with the diagnosis of Asperger's rather than Kenner's autism, for the simple reason that uh, I, I don't actually work with people with Kenner's autism, although I do have several support clients with uh, an Asperger's uh, diagnosis. People on the autistic spectrum frequently find it hard to understand the tacit social rules which regulate and facilitate social interactions. They may also experience hypersensitivity to sensory stimuli. So bearing these sensitivities in mind, what features of heritage attractions are likely to cause problems for people with autistic spectrum disorders and mental health problems? Now, some autistic people, especially children, have difficulties with the social rules of queuing. They may find repeatedly being encouraged to take up membership of heritage organisations at different sites annoying, expecting that having refused it at one site, all the others should automatically know about it, that they're not interested. Autistic visitors may have problems with loud noises, even toilet hand dryers. Strong smells and lurid colour schemes can also be problematic. Autistic people may have a very literal approach to language. So when we as archaeologists or heritage professionals are trying to interpret, interpret artefacts or displays um, vocally, uh, we need to be careful not to speak too alliteratively or indeed to use alliteration within some of the written and printed work that we put out. This can be particularly aggravating. Visitors suffering from generalised anxiety disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder may experience a fight or flight instinctive reaction or even panic attacks triggered by loud noises, crowds, confined spaces, perhaps the skeletons that we might have on display. However, triggers may, as I said, stated, come in forms that are much more innocuous. Words, symbols, smells. Needless to say, absolute avoidance of all possible triggers is likely to be impossible. But the reaction of staff to a visitor displaying odd behaviours, including people sitting and rocking, freezing up, or displaying agitation without obvious cause, can make the difference between a rapid recovery leading to an otherwise enjoyable visit, or a serious meltdown causing distress to the sufferer themselves, their companions and other visitors. I'm going to move on a bit now and talk about uh, archaeology in recovery. I'm trying not to use the T word. Now, there were earlier projects which included people with social disadvantages, including mental health problems. But this particular area seems to have really taken off in a big way in 2012 when two projects were launched which placed archaeology front and centre as what I would tend to think of as occupational therapy. Bear in mind this is partly because my brother's recently qualified as an occupational therapist. The Past and Mind uh, was conceived and directed by Jenny McMillan and Ian Bapti for Mind Herefordshire and involved uh, Kate here. Um, it was a one-off project, although I understand it wasn't. It was hoped that it would spawn further projects, and it investigated a medieval village at Studmarsh in Herefordshire. Mental health service users were involved in the whole process, as I understand it, from planning through data collection, interpretation, and dissemination of findings. The other project was Operation Nightingale. Um, it's a project run by the Defence Archaeology Group, which was founded uh, by Sergeant Dermed Walsh of the Royal Army Medical Corps and Richard Osgood of the Defence Infrastructure Organisation. 
and it has been running on a continuous basis since 2012. I had the uh, great privilege of working with them for about a week and a half back in July of this year at uh, Marne Barracks in Catterick. First time I've been there since doing recruit training there 25 years previously. Um, now, in 2013, after reading about these projects, Fiona Aldred, the chief executive of Mind Aberystwyth, suggested that I provide members with an experience of archaeological field work uh, as a helpful activity. Thus, in 2014 and 2015, I took service users from Mind Aberystwyth on digs at the Cistercian sites of Slanthea and Strata, Florida. The digs were run by David Archaeology and the University of Wales Trinity St David. Feedback from the participants in the, all the projects I've been involved in has been very positive indeed. Um, one particular woman involved in um, the first visit to Clan Clear uh, said it had given her huge enthusiasm for archaeology. Uh, I wasn't able to take her on as many of the uh, days digging as I'd hoped to due to car trouble and she was quite upset at this. Um, I have also located details of uh, an organization in the United States called Archaeologists for Autism. It's a project based in Florida and it organizes an archaeological camp for autistic children which I would very much like to learn more about in due course. So why is archaeological fieldwork effective for people with mental health problems? I believe the most important reason is what occupational therapy expert Jennifer Creek describes as purposeful activity and meaningful occupation. In that, it produces tangible results of real interest and genuine utility. It also absorbs the concentration. I think probably most of us here have probably spent some time fertling away in a trench. And when you're troweling away a layer of earth, your attention is absolutely focused on that area. This parallels mindfulness techniques occupying the mind and driving out distressing thoughts of self-loathing past traumas and of violence. For many people, simply being out of doors, feeling the sun on the skin and the breeze, as well as being away from the everyday environment, greatly helps to ameliorate the effects of mental health problems. Similarly, physical exercise, as provided by shifting spoil, matticking, etc., has been shown to be very effective against mental distress. Working as a team on a dig exercises participant social skills and it can help to build self-confidence and self-esteem. Finally, uh, Fiona Aldred pointed out to me that uh, research published by Dr Chris Lowry of Bristol University in 2007 has suggested that the mycobacterium vacci biology found in soil may have an effect in combating depression. So in organising archaeology as arguably an occupational therapy, there are definitely potential problems and risks to be avoided. Perhaps the biggest worry when taking people with mental health problems on digs is the risk of an overload, crisis or meltdown. By which I mean an incident in which the participant may feel overwhelmed or upset beyond their ability to suppress or deal with those feelings, leading to problematic or dangerous actions. Now in the work I've done in this area, I've discussed the working environment and personal issues with each participant beforehand and I've sought to identify what triggers may need to be avoided or ameliorated and how best to respond if a situation did develop. In the event, one person did require an extended break and the second session also had to be cut short due to someone having left vital medication at home. But much as we might wish it otherwise, there is a stigma attached to mental health problems within British society. 
even if this was not the case, a need for personal privacy would necessitate avoidance of identifying people with mental health problems to other diggers beyond a necessary and or pre-agreed pre extent. In my own work, I've disclosed details only to the uh, dig director and very, very loose sort of generalised details at that. Uh, I also chose to take people onto the Strata Florida dig on the last week that it was operating, at which point most of the students involved in the dig had gone home. So there were fewer people uh, who uh, might interact badly with uh, the people I had taken along. Finally, if accounts of the event are to be used in research or in publicity, professional ethics require ongoing informed consent and, if desired, anonymity for participants involved or recorded in any way. I had thought of including a few photos from uh, one of the projects I did on here, but um, the clients had specifically requested not to be identified, and so none of the photos really show them actually doing much. They tend to be more on the areas where they were working, so I felt they weren't really worth including. So, best practice. I'm going to make reference to uh, Kate Lack's uh, book um, on the Past and Mind project. Uh, it was pointed out in this, in Kate's book, that there's no blueprint or prototype for running such a project. It might be argued, perhaps, that such would be unhelpful, according to the principle that one size almost never fits all in mental health. But perhaps a loose adaptable framework can at least fill some of the daunting emptiness of any new project. Macmillan, ba Macmillan and Baptiste's approach of involving participants at every stage of the project is an inspiringly inclusive idea. I certainly feel so. I would love to be able to include that in my own work. However, the fact that I've been piggybacking my work onto other people's digs makes that rather difficult. Occupational therapists use an ongoing cycle of assessment, treatment and review to ensure that work undertaken by service users is and continues to be helpful and appropriate. As archaeologists, we may be accused of exceeding the limitations of our professional competence if we try to carry this, out, this process out fully ourselves. But record keeping should facilitate, facilitate oversight by and involvement of mental health professionals to keep general con conduct of projects and best practice under continuous review. Finally, as previously stated, client confidentiality and informed consent need to be observed all the way through. So I don't know how well you can see these references there. Uh, I'll just say in conclusion uh, that we have seen that archaeology can be effective in developing recovery or coping strategies for people affected by poor mental health due to it being a real task requiring concentration, requiring teamwork and physical effort located out of doors. One limiting factor in, in provision is funding and it's my hope that further research demonstrating the effectiveness of archaeology in this area will encourage more investment. Interest in archaeology is encouraged and sustained by our heritage industry. I also contend that more can be done by heritage professionals to include people affected by health, mental health problems and developmental disorders. In this area as well, more research would be helpful to provide information on how best to do so for heritage managements. Thank you all very much for listening.